Well, hello everyone. And I am so glad that you all have come to listen to this presentation. And I'm actually going to be sharing my screen here in a minute. Um, let's see, all righty. So I didn't know that. Okay, so if you read the description of this program, and I'm sure you did because you signed up for it, right? Um, I never liked history in school. I was so bored with it. I, I mean, it was the most boring thing. But when I got out of school, I started doing a lot of research, mostly because I'm a genealogy nerd. And so I was, as I was researching my family tree, I would learn so many things when I went in the actual records. And for instance, I was reading the real narratives of people who lived during some of the most remarkable periods in our state's history. And that just, oh, it just lit a fire in me. And I really started loving our history because it just brought it to life. These were real people who lived through real events that just changed the course of everything. So that said, we are going to go through this presentation. I'm gonna take you through several different facts. And as was mentioned, I am an author of a young adult um, fiction series. Uh, Adam Fletcher Adventure Series takes place in the pre-colonial era. It starts in the 1760s. And so my, my books will weave some of this history in there, but it's not like beating you over the head with history or anything. Um, but I write, I write because I love, I love our history and I just love incorporating all of this and weaving in characters' backstories from some of this history we're gonna be talking about tonight. So first things first, I want to mention this right off the bat that I want, to, I want us to make sure we avoid any, you know, as I'm going through history, we're gonna be talking about everything from Indian wars and enslaved people and pirates and all kinds of things. So let's try to avoid any kind of sort of, I guess they call it presentism. Let's, let's not be critical of, you know, things in the past according to current standards because we all have, we learn and we change and we look at things differently. So as I talk about some of these things, just keep in mind, all of these things were done in the era that they were done according to the, the culture of the day. And so with that said, I'm going to proceed into the very beginning where it all starts, the new world. North Carolina is really the new world for the English. Some of you may have seen the Terrence Malick film that came out a few years ago called The New World starring Colin Farrell. Very interesting movie, very bizarre movie. It actually took place at Jamestown. It actually took place with the 1607 expedition that went to Jamestown. But even before that was the real new world when 1584 marked the first of three voyages that were sponsored by Sir Walter Raleigh. And if you're in Wake County, surely you either live in Raleigh or you go there regularly, but the namesake for Raleigh, of course, is Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh was actually knighted by Queen Elizabeth I in 1584. He also became a member of parliament and then he sponsored three voyages to North America that happened in 1584, 1585, and 1587. 1587 is the colony that we know today as the infamous lost colony of Roanoke. Now, this is kind of this is kind of fun. The Queen had great affection for Sir Walter Raleigh. Maybe some of you have heard the story about where he threw down his cape over a puddle so that she didn't have to get her dress dirty crossing this puddle. You know, he apparently wrote poetry that she loved and everything, she just had great affection for him. So he was never actually allowed to travel overseas. So even though these are called the Raleigh voyages or the Raleigh expeditions, he never came here. Nevertheless, her affection for him did not keep him out of the Tower of London where he was sent on three different occasions, but that's another story. And I will be providing links to a lot of the good history that you can dig into after we're all done with this presentation and everything else. So now what were some of the first impressions of this new world? I love this quote that I'm gonna share with you. Let me come back to this. You notice those grapes. Those grapes are the typical scuppernong grapes or muscadine grapes that we have here in North Carolina. And actually I live in Emerald Isle. So it's a little north of, of Wilmington. Um, it's of course, south of, of Cape Lookout in Beaufort. Um, and so we have wild grapes like this all over our yard. They're, these are totally wild here on the island and in fact on all the barrier islands here. But this quote that I'm going to share, I just love this. It's beautiful. This is from the 1584 expedition where Arthur Barlow and Philip Amadas first came here to Roanoke. And this is what, this is what he said. He said, Arthur Barlow wrote, we view the land about us being Whereas we first landed very sandy and low toward the waterside, but so full of grapes 
as the very beating and surge of the sea overflowed them, of which we found such plenty as well there as in all places else, both on the sand and on the green soil on the hills, as in the plains, as well as on every little shrub, as also climbing towards the tops of high cedars that I think in all the world, the like abundance is not to be found. And myself, having seen those parts of Europe that most abound, find such difference as were incredible to be written. So if any of you have ever had Duplin wine or Hennet Vineyards wine or any of the Scuppernong or Muscadine wines, this is what he's talking about because those cultivars were native to our coast before the English ever came. And they're delicious. If you've never had, had them, you definitely should try the grapes. The, the skins are kind of thick and they're a little sour, but the grapes inside are so sweet and just wonderful. And the wines made from it are really something special. So now in, in later voyages, we had, the, we had the 1585 voyage, which gave us the John White map, the John White drawings. This Debray map, Debray actually never came to Theodore de Bry never came to the New World, but he based a series of engravings on the drawings of John White and the, the watercolors of John White. This Indian you see over on the right is one of the watercolors of John White. And if you've ever gone to the History Museum there in Raleigh, I'm sure you've seen some of these. They're available online. But really, any of the images that we find of the New World are based on those John White illustrations. They tell us everything we know about the New World and what this place and its first people looked like in the 16th century upon the first English contact. Now, on this particular slide is, an illust is a watercolor done by John White of Secotan. I don't know how to pronounce that. Nobody knows exactly how to pronounce that. We have to go by what we think from how it would have probably been said phonetically with English spelling from the 16th century. But you see it's circled on the Debray map. And I'm pointing to the actual watercolor that John White did. If any of you have ever been to the Jamestown settlement in Virginia, you will have seen some of these things modeled there because they actually have done the very best job. Yes, I dare say even better than what they have on Roanoke Island of recreating these, these houses and these in the, in the ceremonial circle that you see and all of that you'll see at the Jamestown settlement. But this is one of the villages that was written about and that we have great information from. Another one was Pomioc. Okay, Pomioc, the, the text on this little image here of Pomioc says, the town of Pomioc and the true form of their houses covered and enclosed, some with mats and some with barks of trees, all compassed about with small poles stuck thick together instead of a wall. So this would have been more of a fortress city, whereas the earlier one would have been more of an open, open place. And um, the, these aren't teepees. A lot of people don't, you know, they don't know, but the Indians in North Carolina never lived in teepees. They had houses like this that were typically covered with some sort of mats that were woven from bulrushes and, and grasses and, or barks of trees. And again, you'll see the perfect examples of them at the Jamestown settlement. Here's a picture of that here. But we're, we're, we're talking about the fact that in these 1585 voyages, the English were coming here. But the most famous voyage of all was the, the Lost Colony voyage. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, but I want to jump ahead, and then I'm going to jump back, and you'll understand why. 1709, I'm going to look at a timeline here of, of several years, beginning with 1709, because this was a really pivotal time in North Carolina history. 1709 was when John Lawson published his journal. Okay, all of the librarians have to love these titles. If they've looked at old books from the 17th century, the 18th century, surely they've seen these books that have these super duper long titles. The official title of this was A New Voyage to Carolina, containing the exact descriptions and natural history of that country together with the present state thereof and a journal of a thousand miles traveled through several nations of Indians, giving a particular account of their customs, manners, etc. by John Lawson, Gentleman Surveyor General of North Carolina. So this was basically a travel brochure written by John Lawson. I'm sure he wouldn't have thought of it in such crude terms, but when you get right down to it, if you ever dig into this and you read this, and I highly recommend that you read this, this is absolutely fascinating. John Lawson traveled through South Carolina and he went into North Carolina and he wrote all about the different things that he saw, the different 
indigenous people that he encountered, some of their traditions, some of their cultural habits, you know, the, the atmosphere of the places, what the geography was like and everything else. It was, it was just an amazing work and we have so much information. He also included a good bit of vocabulary in here, but there are also some real gems, one of which answers the question that I'm gonna just say, the lost colony wasn't really lost. And if you haven't already signed up for Scott Dawson's presentation, which I think is this coming Sunday, you should absolutely register to watch his presentation. Scott Dawson is the expert on the lost colony. There is no one who knows about that subject more than him. He's been hands-on involved with excavations on Hatteras Island where his family has lived for centuries. But look at this, this is amazing. This is in John Lawson's very own journal. So this is 1709 when John Lawson publishes this. He had been traveling again along the coast of North Carolina and he encountered the Hatteras Indians. This is from page 62 of his journal. He said, a farther confirmation of this, referring to the English fort at Roanoke, we have from the Hatteras Indians who either then lived on Roanoke Island or much frequented it. These tell us that several of their ancestors were white people and could talk in a book as we do. Talk in a book just means they could read. So he's saying that these Indians had ancestors who were white who could talk in a book. The truth of which is confirmed by gray eyes being found frequently among these Indians and no others. They value themselves extremely for their affinity to the English and are ready to do them all friendly offices. Then he says, I cannot forbear inserting here. Now this is kind of neat y'all. I cannot forbear inserting here a pleasant story that passes for uncontested truth amongst the inhabitants of this place, which is that the ship which brought the first colonies does often appear amongst them under sail in a gallant posture, which they call Sir Walter Raleigh's ship. And the truth of this has been affirmed to me by men of the best credit in the country. So here he is talking to people who were the grandchildren of these so-called lost colonists. They weren't lost, they just went to Croatoan, and they intermarried and assimilated into the people who lived there, and that's that's where they wound up. Now, it's fun to say that they're lost, and it sells a lot of tickets to the play at Roanoke, talking about them being lost, but that's where they went. That's just the way that it is. So, another- Sarah, can I jump in real yes. quick? Yes. Uh, just to say that someone, sorry, um, somebody has asked for live trans transcription to be enabled. So I've done that. Uh, if anybody wants it turned off, if you go under the more um, button, you'll be able to um, stop the live transcript, uh, that kind of thing. Just wanted to let people know. Sorry, carry on. Doing okay, great. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so so this is this is about the lost colony, but then check this out. This is this is this is going to blow your mind because I have to tell you, when I got to this part of John Lawson's journal, this blew my mind. Were there Jewish Indians living along the Pamlico River? Okay, just think about that for a minute. 1709, John Lawson is traveling among these different Indian peoples in these different little villages all along the waterways of North Carolina. And this happens. He says, two families of the Machapunga Indians use the Jewish custom of circumcision and the rest do not. Neither did I ever know any others amongst the Indians that practiced any such thing. And perhaps if you ask them, what is the reason they do so, they will make you no manner of answer, which is as much to say, I will not tell you. I love that. That's so funny. That's like, it's none of your business, dude. It's like, it's none of your business, right? But okay, obviously, let's just think about this for a minute. These people didn't just make this up. You know what circumcision is. These people didn't just say, hey, let's just do this they learned this somewhere okay now i had to do some research about this because this absolutely fascinated me and interestingly i have found at least one jewish member of the roanoke voyages his name was joaquin gans and he was a bohemian or or czech jewish metallurgist and mining engineer he was recruited by sir walter raleigh to join that first Virginia expedition. And we they say Virginia expedition, that was just referring to all the territory of the Carolinas in Virginia, but specifically that expedition that went to Roanoke in 1584. So he was the first Jew in America. They were here for a while. They were here. It's not like they were just here for a couple of weeks and then went back. They were here for a long while. Now, Gans had in recent years completely revamped English methods for smelting copper. 
And before he had done this, it used to take 16 weeks to, to purify a batch of copper ore. But his process that he invented reduced that time to just four days. So he was definitely somebody they really wanted on this expedition. Sir Walter Raleigh asked him to serve as metallurgist and mining supervisor to the Roanoke expedition. And in fact, lumps of smelted copper and a goldsmith's crucible discovered by archeologists among the ruins of Roanoke site have been attributed to, to Joaquin Gons. Now, despite this discovery of copper, the Roanoke colony didn't last. Everyone went back to England. Then of course there was the 1585 colony and the 1587 colony. Joaquin Gons of course went back to England. There's no record of him returning to the American colonies, but then again, he disappears from the records altogether after 1509. And I will mention that in 1590 was when John White sent an expedition back to Roanoke to look for his daughter, his daughter, Eleanor, who of course was married to Ananias Dare and they had the first English child in the New World, Virginia Dare. So John White had sent an expedition back, came back in 1590. We don't know, Joaquin Gons might've come then. He might've come to Jamestown in 1607. But the point is, Somehow or another, this Jewish tradition of circumcision wound up on the Pamlico River with the Machapunga Indians. Okay. Now let's go forward in our timeline. 1711, John Lawson is executed. This was also the year that started the Tuscarora War. So I have to, I have to get to this. First of all, on that Debray map, again, based on the John White illustrations, you'll see a word mongwak, and you'll see it written in different ways in different places at that time. But this was basically any Indians that were west of the Algonquian territory in the east. This would have generally referred to the Iroquois and Tuscarora and possibly the Meharan and other more inland tribes. I mean, it could have even possibly referred to the Cher as far west as the Cherokee. The point was these were Indians that were farther west and this was not an area where the English were really wanting to go at this, at this particular time. And so they were getting this word from the Algonquian Indians who were referring to these Indians in the west with this word, which basically meant snakes. They were snakes. This, is not, this might be alarming to you that, that one tribe was calling another tribe snakes, but this is not very different than what has happened with, this, with the word Sioux. The Lakota, Nakota, Dakota Indians don't refer to themselves as Sioux. They refer to themselves by those names, but the Ojibwe and other tribes might have referred to them as Sioux because that word meant like little snakes. So this was a very common term. It just meant like treacherous people, people that were dangerous, people that you know, you didn't trust. And so different tribes obviously didn't always trust each other. So that's where this word comes from. But I, in, the, in the teaser for this whole presentation is that the Tuscarora War might not have been the most accurate name for that war. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So in 1711, September, as a matter of fact of 1711, we have the capture of John Lawson and Baron Christoph von Grafenried. Christoph von Grafenried was a Swiss Baron who actually brought several colonists that were from Germany and Switzerland to settle what became known as Newbern in 1710. Lawson and von Grafenried were not great friends. In fact, von Grafenried did not like John Lawson very much. He was probably annoyed with him because John Lawson was sort of a free spirit. Von Grafenried was far more traditional. And uh, if you ever read von Grappenried's account of what happened in this whole thing that I'm going to be describing here, you'll see it's very lengthy. It's it's um, it's very entertaining reading, very very informative. But Lawson tried to convince von Grappenried to come with him. This is this is of course before he's executed to come with him to explore part of eastern North Carolina. First, telling him, let's go. We we we're, we're go pick some grapes. There's like a lot of grapes. These are really good grapes. And von Grappenried's like, are you kidding? I'm, we're not, no, I'm not going into the inland territory to pick grapes. That's ridiculous. So Lawson finally was able to convince him to accompany him by saying, well, let's, hey, you know what, let's see if the Noose River, let's see if that might give us a shorter passage to Virginia. Because that, that's there, you know, they're still trying to figure out where things go and how to get to different places and what's the shortest way to get there. So this is, you know, something that said, okay, that makes sense to Von Graf and Reed. He's like, okay, We'll do that. We'll we'll do that. Now there are multiple narratives that are available to you about the events that I'm going to to tell you, but I'm giving the abridged version. The real stuff is way more interesting, but I'm gonna shorten it because otherwise this thing will just go on forever and nobody has time for that. But the Baron's narrative is just captivating. So 
Here are some abridged excerpts. I'm gonna read these excerpts as though he wrote them, but again, I've abridged them to make them a little quicker. He says, I took everything that was necessary, including provisions for 14 days. I asked Mr. Lawson whether there was danger from the Indians, especially the ones we didn't know. He said, nah, he had already made the trip and it was entirely safe. He said there were, quote, no wild Indians on this arm of the river. They were a good distance away. Von Grappenried continues, still just to be safe, I took two black men, to, he said Negroes, to row and two Indians we knew with whom we got along with well. One understood the English language, so I thought if we had these two Indians with us, we should have no problem, no fear from the others, so we traveled right on up. And against my better judgment, Lawson had convinced me to bring a couple of horses. Well, when we had to go over the river, one of the Indians took off to the Indian village nearby on one of the horses. Now, I don't know if he lost his way or if he did it treacherously. He came to the great Indian village, Katechna, where he was immediately asked what the horse was doing because the Indians don't use horses. So you can imagine them seeing this Indian riding up on a horse and they're like, whoa, what, what is this? What are you doing? Where are you going? What is this huge beast? What is this? What is happening here? Well, so to make a long story short, the Indians in the village were suspicious about his answer. So they took the horse and told him that the group could go no further into the country. And the king of this village commanded that they be brought to his village. So they went there under duress. Von Grafenried continues. He says, we met already two armed Indians there who looked as though they were coming from hunting. And I didn't like that. I said, I thought we should go back. Mr. Lawson laughed at me, but before we turned around, it became serious so that his laughter disappeared. I mean, think about that like for a minute. So so Von Grappenried's already panicky. He's nervous and he's like, we, we need to go back. And John Lawson's laughing at him. And then all of a sudden it, it turns serious and Lawson's like, he stops laughing. It's not funny anymore. All of a sudden out of the bushes and swimming through the river came such a number of Indians and overpowered us that it was impossible to defend ourselves unless we wanted to have ourselves shot dead or tortured. We were taken prisoners, robbed and led away. Now at 3 a.m. they arrived at Katechna. King Hancock von Grafenried said was sitting in all his glory upon a raised platform whereas Indians were typically accustomed to sitting on the ground. So they didn't normally sit on a platform but he was because he was the king. There were some words back and forth, and then around noon, the king himself brought some food in. Okay, this description, y'all, is great. Von Grafenried says, he brought some food in a lousy fur cap. Of course, it looks like lousy, but lousy, like a fur cap that might have even had lice in it. Cornmeal dumplings and boiled venison was served, and the baron said he ate with great repugnance because he was hungry. In the evening, there was essentially a war council of Indians from the Noose, Trent, and Pamlico rivers, who wanted to deal with, quote, surly Englishmen who were a real problem. So what was happening around this time was there, was there were Indians being taken by some of the colonists. Some of them were actually being pressed into slavery. Some of the Indian children were being taken, I'm sure, by English people who thought they were well-meaning, that they were going to educate and, and, you know, civilize these children and everything else. In any case, John Lawson got into an argument with Cora Tom, who was not Tuscarora. So we're getting to the part where I'm talking about the Tuscarora War might not have been the best name for this war. Cora Tom, and it ultimately led to John Lawson and the Baron being sentenced to execution. But the Baron was able to talk his way out of it, but John Lawson, no such mercy was to be had. So what Von Grappenried wrote about that execution was he said, to be sure, I had heard from several savages that the threat had been made that he was to have his throat cut with a razor, which was found in his sack. The smaller Negro who was left alive also testified to this, but some say he was hanged, others that he was burned. The savages keep it very secret how he was killed. Have May God have pity on his soul. Now, I'll tell you that growing up in North Carolina, growing up in Raleigh in the fourth grade and in the eighth grade, we heard a little bit about this story, but I remember back in, in those days, and I was going to school back in the 80s and in the early 90s, but I remember the story being that he was stuck full of, of light wood matches and set on fire. So I don't know how anyone came to that conclusion because that's not what Von Grafenried says, but that was the way the story was told. After this execution, the War Council set out their attacks on the Noose and Pamlico Rivers, but who was there? Who was there? Von Grafenried tells us who was at this War Council. He said there were about 500 fighting men collected together, partly Tuscaroras, although the principal villages of this nation were not involved. 
the other Indians, the Marmesquites, which also would have been known also as the Matamesquite, those of Bay River, Weetok, Pamtico, Noose, and the Corps began this massacring and plundering at the same time. Von Graffenreid was held captive for about six weeks. He saw a boy from his town that had been taken captive whose whole family had been massacred. So this, so what happened was these, these Indians at this war council, they just decided we've got to put a stop to this English, this English nonsense. So they set out on the Noose and Pimlico rivers and they massacred so many colonists. Here's one description of a massacre that was given by Christopher Gale in November of 1711. So this would have been a couple of months after it happened. He said, the family of one Mr. Neville was treated after this manner. The old gentleman himself, after being shot, was laid on the house floor with a clean pillow under his head, his wife's head clothes put upon his head, his stockings turned over his shoes, and his body covered all over with new linen. His wife was set upon her knees and her hands lifted up as, as, as if she was at prayers, leaning against a chair in the chimney corner, and her coats turned up over her head. In other words, her dress was pulled up over her head. A son of his was laid out in the yard with a pillow laid under his head and a bunch of rosemary laid to his nose. A Negro had his right hand cut off and he was left dead. The master of the next house was shot and his body laid flat upon his wife's grave. Women were laid on their house floors and great stakes run up through their bodies. Others big with child, the infant, infants were ripped out and hung in the trees. In short, their manner of butchery has been so various and uncountable that it would be beyond credit to relate them. So that war was a terrible war, but it was not just the Tuscarora, okay? 1713 was a, a turning point in the war. It was the fall at Fort Neoheroga. Fort Neoheroga was a Tuscarora fort that was in what is today known as Greene County near Snow Hill. And what's so interesting is if you look at this map, this is a close-up of that map I just showed you. Over, over on, let's see, are you all able, I don't know if you're able to see my mouse, but there's a section over here on the right that says the Yamasee Battery. So there were actually Indians that were from South Carolina that were brought up to fight the Tuscarora and the other Indians. The Cherokee also participated in this. And the reason why was because these other Indians thought of the Tuscarora and these their allies as enemies. And so it, it was, uh, there were a whole lot of Indians involved with this war. I think it just should be called the Indian War, the Great Indian War, because there were so many tribes that were involved and not all Tuscarora were involved with this in such a way that they were fighting the English. In fact, some were allies of the English. So let's move on from here. So after the Tuscarora War, the colony is really in bad shape. I mean, the, it, so much expense had been used to bring up the South Carolina forces to help because North Carolina was still such a fledgling colony. Charles Eden becomes the royal governor. Now this slide's gonna seem like it's coming from out of the blue, but it's really not because here's the thing. Blackbeard would have never risen to the prominence that he had had it not been for the Tuscarora War. I'll just say it. That might sound crazy, but it's true, and I'll explain. So Eden came in, like I said, at the tail end of the, the Indian War, and his administration, it instituted land and use taxes and reduced half the debts resulting from the war. Okay, think about this for just a minute. Back in those days, there was no such thing as an income tax, okay? Any taxes would have been on things that you maybe you bought or used or maybe taxes just on your land, but there was no such thing as an income tax. But Eden had come in and he had reduced some debts, but nevertheless, there was still a lot of rebuilding to be done. And this is where Blackbeard comes in. So in 1718, Blackbeard brings his treasure to Bath and he receives a pardon from Governor Eden, or he comes to receive a pardon from Governor Eden. So this is the image we all have of Blackbeard. Just let me just say for a minute, this is ridiculous. Anytime you ever see these illustrations of Blackbeard having fuses lit from his beard, it's, you, it just it's, think logically about this. This is nonsense. You're not going to be on a ship with your face on fire because the wind can shift at any moment and that would cause your whole face to go up in flames. Also, any of the illustrations that you see of Blackbeard were not done by his contemporaries. They were done by people who had heard all of these extraordinary tales about who he was. And in fact, Charles Johnson, who wrote A General History of Pirates, and some people argue about who that author really was, he really put a lot of just extraordinary stuff in there that doesn't necessarily have any basis in fact, but that's where a lot of the information that is in the common stories about Blackbeard comes from. The very best Blackbeard researcher is Kevin Duffus. He wrote 
The Last Days of Blackbeard the Pirate. It is phenomenal. If you can find that book, get it. If not, look for his lectures on YouTube. Kevin Duffus is absolutely amazing, and I have learned a ton from him. This is so important. Now, Blackbeard's treasure that he brought to Bath was not, as many might think, gold, but it, rather it was a treasure of enslaved Africans. Listen to this. Kevin actually sent me this. He's a friend. He said, this is a little excerpt from one of his presentations that really lays out exactly what happened. When Blackbeard and his inner circle of officers and confidants learned of the king's offer to pardon pirates from a merchant captain in early December 1717 off the southeast coast of Puerto Rico, they were faced with a complicated choice. They could have sailed for nearby Jamaica to surrender to its royal governor, but there was the likelihood that they would have had to give up their newly acquired ship, the Queen Anne's, Queen Anne's Revenge, and its 60 slaves. If so, they would have been stuck on Jamaica with no transportation home, but worse, as vagrant seamen, many of them could have been pressed into service in His Majesty's Navy, and for former pirates who had acquired a taste for plentiful food and wine, that was a fate worse than death. Conversely, the longer Blackbeard and his companions held on to the large, heavily armed vessel crowded with hundreds of men, it would have been necessary to continue pirating in order to keep everyone sufficiently fed and happily fueled with rum. Armies marched on their stomachs, Napoleon is believed to have said. Likewise, pirates sailed on their bellies, and truth be told, their addiction to alcohol. Hundreds of pirates aboard Queen Anne's Revenge burned through provisions quickly. If Blackbeard and his pirate cohort from Bath were hoping to return home to North Carolina, especially with their 60 slaves, because the Queen Anne's Revenge had previously been La Concorde, which was a French slaver, they took that ship. They only kept a small portion of the slaves on the ship. Everyone else they left on an island. So if he's wanting to return with the 60 slaves, they would have to steer clear of the earliest opportunity to surrender to continue their pirating after the January 5th deadline to keep everyone fed and then take their chances by accepting Governor Eden's expired non-valid pardon upon their arrival at Bath. Blackbeard and his men sailed past four ports where they could have surrendered they even declined the offer of the governor of South Carolina to receive a pardon from him while they were blockading the port of Charleston. The reason why this is important is because it doesn't make sense that if he was really just wanting to get the pardon, he wouldn't have stopped at any of those other ports. Why would he have put himself and his men at risk to go to North Carolina unless he was a man on a mission? But the fact of the matter is Blackbeard and his men, many of them were Bath town boys, okay? I'm gonna skip past this slide real quick and come back to it in a minute. All right. This is an interesting illustration of Blackbeard. This painting was actually commissioned um, and it was done by a local bath watercolor artist named Jeffrey Jacob. It captures Blackbeard and his crew as imagined during a layover in Bath. And it reflects the deeply held belief by the Beaufort County Genealogical Society that Blackbeard was one of their own hometown boys from Bath and so were many of his crew. Beaufort County Genealogical Society has proven 16 names on the Virginia list of Blackbeard's pirates capped at Ocracoke, and 14 are listed as hanged in Williamsburg in March 1719. Five of the 16 were slaves, four of whom were named as evidence and executed. Caesar did not give evidence and was not specifically mentioned as executed. Coincidentally, Caesar was the name of a slave of Tobias Knight. Now, the fellow standing there next to this Blackbeard and the green jacket is supposed to represent Tobias Knight. Tobias Knight was the one found with a letter written by Blackbeard, or I'm sorry, there was a letter written by Tobias Knight found on Blackbeard when Blackbeard was, was executed. But Caesar was the slave of Tobias Knight. They're the names of three remaining men were three landowners who were alive and well after the date of the supposed hanging on the west side of Bathtown Creek, James Robbins, Edward Salter, and John Martin. There are so many names that were involved with Blackbeard's men that were living in Bath. Those families lived in Bath. The surnames of the families lived in Bath. All of this can be fleshed out. I have information that I'll pro provide about this at the end of the presentation, because some of you, if you have roots in Eastern North Carolina, may be connected to some of these men, so you may have a connection to, to Blackbeard. But let me come back to this real quick. This is the shipwreck of the Queen Anne's Revenge. That was that was discovered years ago and they've been doing an archeological excavation of it. It's really remarkable. But you'll hear about the fact that this shipwreck 
it was that it was at Beaufort. You'll hear some people say that he wrecked his ship at Beaufort, but he didn't actually wreck it at Beaufort. It was near Beaufort Inlet. And if you see this map, you see that it shows Fort Macon on the left and over on the right, you see Shackleford Banks. And if you've ever been to any of these places, you know these places, it's not like they're just, you just don't hop across one to the other. There, there's some distance between these places. But Queen Anne's Revenge was off the coast of Beaufort Inlet. And so there's, there's another point related to this geography, but I'm going to jump ahead. I, I wanted to point this out because sometimes people don't really understand Beaufort versus Port Beaufort or Beaufort Inlet, and that, that, that comes in here. So in 1718, that was when Blackbeard was assassinated. And I'll say he was assassinated because really what we have is Governor Spotswood determined to kill Blackbeard. Virginia and South Carolina were very competitive with North Carolina. North Carolina was never much of a slave colony. Virginia and South Carolina were. Governor Spotswood did not like Blackbeard because he, had, he definitely had been doing pirating near Virginia, just as he had done pirating near South Carolina. But Blackbeard was one of Governor Eden's friends. That was why Blackbeard went to Bath and took the slaves because the slaves, let's face it, would have been appreciated by the colonists at that time because they would have helped rebuild after the Tuscarora War. So if Blackbeard, if a lot of his pirating came about because he was trying to avoid capture and trying to get to Governor Eden for that pardon, then it, it follows that all of that pirating that he did, he wouldn't have done had he not been just trying to get to Governor Eden. The main reason he had gone into piracy was to get to capture some of the gold from the Spanish fleets that had sunk down in the Caribbean. It wasn't that he was just interested in robbing people up and down the Eastern seaboard. A lot of those pir piratical behaviors happened while he was trying to get back to Bath from his friend, Governor Eden, to get that pardon. All right, so 1719, there were some interesting depositions given on Blackbeard, um, and I'll link, I'll have, I'll provide a link to that. I'm afraid this is going to get too long to go too much into it, but for Blackbeard to have been such a terrible pirate, boy, the, one of the depositions that was given sure does make him sound really just kind of drunk and silly, to be honest. Okay, now this is one thing that I want to get to when it comes to Beaufort and Beaufort Inlet and locations and things that aren't always what they seem. Last year, and this is connected to slavery. So I know these things seem like they're jumping around, but these are all, everything here is connected. Last year in October, there was a, there was a ceremony held in Beaufort at Topsail Park. And they commemorated this new plaque to mark this particular site as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a Middle Passage Project Site as a part of the Middle Passage and slavery in North Carolina. And this is the thing. There are some serious problems with this that I'm going to explain, and this connects back to that geography I was talking about a minute ago. Um, and I, 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 I appreciate wanting to document the history of enslaved peoples and the Middle Passage and all of that because it's all so important, but I just think this was such a huge missed opportunity. So this sign has, there's some problems with it. And in fact, I consulted, I contacted the people who were involved with the Middle Passage Project to find out what their sources were. And I, I, I got them and I, I ended up learning what I suspected, which is that there was some, some mistaken things that went into this, but we'll, let's talk about it. First, there was this part of the sign that says Beaufort, North Carolina was involved in the transatlantic human trade and is documented Middle Passage arrival site. Enslaved people disembarked at or near this event, exact location now called Topsail Park, Topsail Park being in Beaufort. Re records, show from seven, records from 1769 show that one particular ship transported 36 Africans directly from the coast of Africa to the port of Beaufort, North Carolina. Okay, this is super important. This is where it helps when you're digging into the original sources and you actually you do a lot of research in one area because sometimes things aren't what they seem. So Beaufort, North Carolina is not the port of Beaufort. Port Beaufort, like, yes, we think of Beaufort, the town of Beaufort as the heart, is like the, the main place for Port Beaufort. But in the colonial era, there was a very, very different distinction. They were not the same thing at all. Okay, so in the colonial era, we had multiple ports. We had Port Brunswick, which covered the Cape Fear area. So that was that the town of Brunswick below Wilmington. So that was everything down that way. Port Beaufort handled 
the commerce through Topsail Inlet near Cape Lookout. Now Topsail Inlet, I'm gonna come back to this slide. Topsail Inlet is what we call, it was called Beaufort Inlet, that inlet there between Fort Macon and Shackleford Banks, all right? Um, so, th but Port Beaufort would have handled any ships that came in through there that would have gone all the way up, all the way even into the Neuse River. Newburn was covered by Port Beaufort, okay? Port Bath was another one, and then there was Port, Cor Port Currituck. So I wrote, like I said, I wrote to folks that were handling the Middle Passage Project here in North Carolina, and I asked for their supporting evidence. And the document they sent to me in their reference says, although the Colonial Assembly established ports or custom districts, it goes on to say that Port Beaufort had two centers at Beaufort and Newburn in 1722. And in his discussion of the import trade of North Carolina, 1763 to 1775, a historian named Christopher Crittenden said that, quote, a few Negro slaves came from the British West Indies, but very, and then another said, very few Negroes were actually imported into the colony during the 18th century. So this is the thing. With this illustration that you see here, there is one of the typical slave ship illustrations where you see all those poor bodies in the, in the hull of, in the body of the ship. They're lined up and it's, I mean, those are horrific images. But the thing is, Beaufort never had any water deep enough to receive a ship like that. Taylor Creek is what comes in front of Beaufort. So you would have never had a ship this deep come into Beaufort, into like to the town of Beaufort. No one ever was disembarked there as, as far as a slave ship. Am I telling you that no slaves ever came to Beaufort? No, of course not. That would be nonsense. But what I'm telling you is there was never any anything like as part of the slave trade as far as slave ships coming to auction slaves off at Beaufort or anything like that. The kind of ships you would have had coming to Beaufort, the town, I'm telling you this in case you ever go there and you see this sign, don't be under the impression that it was like Charleston where you had these huge slave ships that would come to the port there. They would never come to Beaufort. Chances are if a huge ship was passing through Port Beaufort, it was actually going to Newburn because Newburn was the, the colonial capital that was where there were a lot of slave sales that were happening at Newburn. In fact, they had a slave market right, right there in front of the courthouse. It was really sad. But the, kind of, the only kinds of vessels you would typically see in front of Beaufort would have been sloops, which is that image you see on the lower left, or periaugers. And I'm going to show you one of those in a minute. But more often, if you saw any record about any actual enslaved people coming to Beaufort, it would be like this document over on the right where it says a manifest of goods on board the schooner industry. And then it goes on to list, this is 1735, parcel of household goods, one, one case, one something of European goods, 30 bushels of salt, and then two Negro men, two Negro men. So that's not what you think of when you think of the kind of ship that they have on that, that monument that they have there at that park. And, um, in fact, let me come here and show you what a periauger looks like, because this is really cool. That is a periauger in the top left, y'all. That periauger was actually built by the Beaufort Maritime Museum. They have a watercraft center there where they build historic boats and historic crafts. And this particular periauger was used in the amazing film Harriet that came out a couple of years ago about Harriet Tubman. They used several of these boats, but periaugers were one of the most common vessels you would see in North Carolina waters in the colonial era. Another thing on that huge marker there at Topsail Park is that little newspaper thing you see in the lower left there. <laughs> Excuse me. But it says, entered in Port Beaufort. Over on the right, I have the real newspaper clipping so you can really read it. It's, it's bigger, it's more text, so you can, you can see what it says. Unfortunately, with the image I got from the newspaper, it was just so small, I couldn't, it doesn't read very easily. But over on the right, you'll see it says, entered in Port Beaufort from the 1st of October, 1763 through the 1st of October, 1764. And it lists five different kinds of vessels, but only one of those types of vessels would be something that could have even come to the town of Beaufort, that's the sloops. But then below, there is a thing where it says 179 slaves among all those other things, but that's over the course of a whole year. So what I'm saying is the, the, the sign that you see there is not exactly accurate. Um, and so any chances are any slave ships, they really should have, I wish they had put that marker at Newburn. Newburn would have been the place, would have been the place to highlight where the slave trade was happening in North Carolina in a bigger way. But now this connected to, connected to that is this next thing. And you're going to wonder what in the world, who are these guys? 
Well, speaking of slavery, this is this is neat and it ties back into Beaufort history. This this is the group that was the first to start what is now known as the Beaufort Pirate Invasion. In July of 17, not 1760, July of 1960, the town firemen participated in Beaufort's first reenactment of an event that happened in 1747 called the Spanish Invasion of Beaufort. This, this whole idea came up from a man named Graydon Paul. And so they had this really cool thing that was supposed to reenact this Spanish invasion of Beaufort in 1747. And they were thought of as Spanish pirates. But I did some research about this and this is where it ties back into slavery. This is really cool history and it connects directly into my books because I have, I have some of this that are especially in captured in the Caribbean. Who were the ones who invaded Beaufort and the Spanish invasion of Beaufort? So here we have Francisco Menendez, that he's on the left there. He was a runaway slave from the Carolinas who became captain of the Fort Mose militia at St. Augustine in what was then Spanish Florida. He, he, he may have had some involvement with the Spanish invasion of Beaufort in 1747, but this is what we know. The colonial records North Carol of North Carolina tell us that in 1747, Spaniards took possession of the town and harbor of Beaufort. And it says that these Spanish vessels were largely manned by, quote, Negroes and mulattoes. And it, um, I was just fascinated by this. I'm just thinking if they're Spanish, how are they Negroes and mulattoes, as they say? So I did some more research. Well, who were they? And then I continued finding in the colonial records a little bit more about this. It said in volume four of the North Carolina colonial records in 1747, several small sloops in Barcalonjos crept along the coast from St. Augustine, armed full of men, mostly mulattoes and Negroes, their small draft securing them from the attacks of the only ship of war on our coast. They landed at Ocracoke, Core Sound, Bear Inlet, and Cape Fear, where they killed several people, burned some ships and small vessels, carried off some Negroes, and slaughtered a great number of cattle and hogs. These practices continued all the summer of 1747 and led to the erection of several forts along the coast. So why would Negroes, as they say, and mulattoes have carried off some Negroes? I can think of a few reasons, but if we know who these Black Spaniards were from St. Augustine, maybe we can ascertain why they would have been interested in doing this. So Fort Mose, which was really known as Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose in St. Augustine, Florida. This was Spanish Florida. It was established as America's first Black, free Black settlement. It was a sanctuary for runaway slaves. And all of this sounds wonderful. And you think, oh, that's so nice. They had, you know, they had this free settlement for runaway slaves. But here's the thing. This was not just like some great altruistic thing that the Spanish did in Florida at this time. These people were pressed into service as basically pawns in Spain's hands. They were forced to fight the English. They were on the front lines. They were the ones, and they, they did all this to be able to have their freedom, but it wasn't like they were able to truly enjoy being free. And in fact, a good number of these people ended up being pressed back into slavery once this particular period was over. So then you might wonder, well, why was Beaufort a target? Well, Beaufort would have been a target because as of the time of the invasion, there were only 320 taxables in, in all of Carteret County. Carteret County wasn't just Beaufort. The town of Beaufort only had 32 taxables, which, and taxables were considered anyone who was a white person, male, age 16 or up, and all Negroes, mulattoes, musties, male or female, and all persons of mixed blood. Beaufort had very, very, very few people. There just were not many people. So 32 ta taxables in 1748. So Beaufort would have been seen as a point of weakness in the colony, and it would have been a great way for Spain to needle North Carolina and needle the English by attacking one of the weaker colonies in one of the weaker places. And it would be even more humiliating by the fact that this was being done by, as they say, Negro and mulatto, um, basically pirates, all right? So we didn't have big, big ports like Charleston. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have a lot of what you had happening there. Every little port we had was of critical importance. But when we think about those 32, those 32 settlers that were in Beaufort in 1748, we have to think, look at this sign, which makes this sign make even less sense. This is another sign that's not true. 
This sign is in the old burying ground in Beaufort. This sign says, here lies the remains of settlers killed during the Tuscarora Indian War, September 1711. Y'all, I love Beaufort. I, am, I have so many friends in Beaufort that are involved with Beaufort tourism and everything. I've called the Beaufort Historic Association and I've asked them why they have this sign. Where did you get the information for this sign? And basically the answer I got was that there was a lady who gave them a little history and this is what it said. But the thing is, it's not true. I've, I've consulted with people that I know in archeology span and I've asked them if there's ever been any such study that would prove this and the answer is no. But even logically, it wouldn't make any sense because as a town, Beaufort wasn't fully established in 1711. There was virtually no one there in 1711. 1709, you had a few people who actually owned land near there, but there certainly weren't enough to have a group of settlers that were killed and then buried in the old burying ground. Not to mention, even if anyone had found remains of settlers that were there that might have looked like they were killed in an Indian war, you wouldn't know if they were English or if they were Indian. There's, there's just, there's no way to know. And it doesn't make sense because the Tuscarora War did not happen in Beaufort. So sometimes this, the history on a sign is just completely wrong. But when you know history of a place, when you know what really happened in a place, you can think more critically about it and you can try to make sense of, did this really happen or is this just a fun thing to think about? Or is this just a fun, a fun story? Another great example, if you've ever been to Beaufort, and I have some friends in Beaufort who would probably be really mad that I'm putting this in here, but I'm gonna do it anyway. On the left is a picture of the little girl buried in a barrel of rum that they have at the old burying ground in Beaufort. And then on the right is a woman who was buried in a barrel of rum in Oakdale Cemetery in Wilmington. And I want you to just, let's think critically about this. I've always had a problem with this story on the left about the little girl buried in the barrel of rum in Beaufort because they know this whole elaborate story that she desperately had wanted to see her where her family came from in England and the mother never wanted her to go. And then when the little girl was old enough, she finally allowed the father to take her back to England to see where they came from. And she was able to see all the sites, but then the poor girl fell ill on the traffic trap, the, the voyage back home and she died. But her father wanting to keep the promise to the girl's mother had her put in her body put in a barrel of rum to bring her back to Beaufort where she was then buried here in the old burying ground. Why do we know that whole story, but we don't know their names? I mean, that like, how do we know all of that? And we don't know their names. That doesn't make any sense. At least in Oakdale Cemetery in Wilmington, where there's a story of a young woman who was buried in rum, there is more detail to the story. And we, we know it's, she's buried in the Martin family plot there. Her name was apparently Nancy Martin. And apparently she died, she was in her twenties, but she died on a, on a ship and they put her on a chair and they fastened her to the chair and then put that in a barrel. And then it was filled with rum to preserve her body, to bring her back. And then she was buried. Are either of these stories true? We don't know, but I'm just telling you when you know your history and when you see things, first of all, don't always believe everything you see on a sign because it might not be true. But when you know your history and you know what happened in a place, you can think critically about it. And, and sometimes truth is, is way more fascinating than fiction. I certainly thought that was true of the Spanish invasion of Beaufort, learning all that backstory of the runaway slaves who were, had this whole, whole fort in Florida where they were able to live. And then they came to Beaufort and they're the ones who led that invasion. That's amazing. That's way more interesting than just saying some Spaniards showed up and invaded the place. You know, and same thing with the lost colony. I mean, imagining that it's lost is a neat mystery, but when we think about the fact that no, these people, they assimilated into the, the first people who were here and they had beautiful families and their descendants are still in North Carolina today. It's really also fascinating. So I'm just wrapping everything up here, but these are several different things that I think we don't learn, we don't learn about in North Carolina history. Certainly if you're relying on the, the historical markers, they might not be right but I'm all about this. I have a lot of this type of information on, on different websites that I have. And in fact, I have would re request that if you want more information about any of this, please visit my website, but wait and do it at the end of this week. I, I was, I've mentioned to all the librarians, I had a very, very, very bad week with a lot of very traumatic things happening. Uh, we had a death in the family. We had a dog in the hospital. We just a lot going on. And so the, all the, the resources that I wanted to put together for you who have attended this, 
to put on my website. I just haven't had a chance to post them yet, but I'm a website developer, so I can do that quickly. So I'll have that done by the end of the week. So by the end of this week, visit sarahwhitford.com and you'll be able to find references to all these stories and articles and these historic references that I gave and everything else. And so with, with that said, if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Sarah, that was so informative. I had no idea about 95% of what you went over. And granted, fire hose, right? I'm, sorry. I'm a I'm a Floridian, so I don't have the the North Carolina history background or you know the the school stuff that that a lot of North Carolinians do um but that was absolutely fascinating and you're, you're right it goes to show I mean I see the road sign yeah. uh roadside signs all the time we've got them around carry we've got them I mean they're everywhere and I've always just kind of taken them as fact yeah. uh but now it makes me not question it because I'm sure the majority of them are right Absolutely. but some of them may need a little more you know information digging and and that kind of thing yeah um oh Selena says that she is North Carolina born and bred and didn't know like more than half of of what you you shared so oh. you are just you're educating all of us tonight uh, do we have any questions? Heidi, did you see any questions? No, but I, right, not right now, but I have a couple. Yes. Okay, good. So which story uh, or which part of the history drives you the most crazy with its inaccuracies? Um, I would say one of the, honestly, like of all these different things, one of the things that drives me the most crazy, and in fact, my love like I, I cannot tell you how much I love North Carolina history, but I lose interest in it when we get after the Revolutionary War. And the reason for that is because when it comes to the history of slavery in North Carolina, it's so misunderstood and misrepresented. Like I said, North Carolina was never a big slave state. There just wasn't the need for it here. And I say need, understand we're talking in the context of that era, right? Nobody needs slaves, but if you're looking at that colonial era, and you're looking at the way planters thought about things in Virginia or in South Carolina, or even, you know, the cities in New England thought about things. North Carolina just had did not have the same, the same plantations in place. They had some, but it wasn't like you find in South Carolina and Virginia. But also, you know, a place like Beaufort was, it was so tiny. There just wasn't much there. And, um, and so you you can't paint everything with the same brush when you're looking at history, you know. And um, another thing that I found really fascinating, I, I I love especially history relating to um, to slavery. I have ancestors that were free people of color that show up. It's it's interesting. On 1790 census, 1800 census, there are free people of color, but by 1810, they're passing as white. And I'm sure it's because they were mixed and they mixed out to the point that they were just passing as white. You know what I mean? But um, so this is something that's sort of dear to my heart. There, there's, these, there's these whole communities in Eastern North Carolina where you have free people of col color living, a whole lot of them. People tend to think a lot of times of that era and they think everyone who was black or everyone who was of something other than white was a slave, but they, it's, that's not true. There were a lot of people who were free and they were living and doing business with everyone else like, normal i mean it was it was it's it's in chocolinity beaufort county is i there's a ton of that happening it's like these little enclaves where you have these mixed race people and i think it just wasn't a big deal to them and so it drives me nuts because in our history we 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 tend to think things were all a certain way but they weren't also amazingly newburn was set on like craven county was set on fire by the revolution the independent spirit became really popular so a lot of people were emancipating their slaves after the american revolution just because they were so inspired by the idea of liberty and freedom and they you know they were really thinking about how hypocritical it was to want to celebrate their own freedom so you started having a lot of that happening but you don't hear about that you know and i didn't include that in this just there was just so much to cover in the really old period but um but yeah so i would say you know anything relating to the slavery is something that really fascinates me 
So it's interesting because one of the programs next week, <laughs> you're you going to say this, Erin? Yes. Um, we have a professor from American University who is going to talk about uh, the Great Dismal Swamp and the, the, the communities deep in the swamp of enslaved people and natives that mixed and had a whole like secret communities in there. Yep. Yep. That's very true. A lot of that happened. A lot of that happened all over coastal North Carolina because, you know, you had they would they would be called maroon colonies and I mean you'll you'll hear about that and basically maroon colonies were where you had black and indigenous people marrying and having families and everything else um, but you know it's if you ever read there's there's there was a book that was written by William Byrd in the I can't remember exactly when it was written I'm thinking it was the late 1600s but it was called the dividing line between North Carolina and Virginia and basically it was him and others that were sent to survey the line between North Carolina and Virginia mm -hmm. and he wrote about people in North Carolina. He wrote about people here being lazy and they just sit around on their porches all day. They just don't do a whole lot. He was talking about like the Englishman, you know what I mean? He was talking about the fact these are just not a very motivated, industrious people, you know? And I just, I think about like the sort of, and that's not to say everyone here was lazy, but he was comparing it to what he had seen in Virginia, which is you have all these probably plantations that are running in a certain way that was really, you know, orderly. And they were probably having all these slaves working like little factory workers and just, you know, just it's 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 just a whole different thing. There's just so much there's so much of a difference between just even different colonies that are right beside each other. But yeah, you definitely have those mixed those mixed um, villages, those mixed communities happen. Yeah, that uh, that program that Heidi just mentioned, the um, the understanding the people who dwelled in the Great Dismal Swamp. I am really looking forward to that. Um, he's going to talk about uh, findings. So he's a uh, professor and archaeologist, and okay. this is next Monday night, y'all. Um, he's going to be talking about findings that he and his colleagues uncovered through excavations in the um, kind of the first decade of the 2000s um, and what that shows about the African-American and Indigenous American communities who, who lived within that swamp. Um, if anyone had joined us for our Outlander series or you've read the Outlander series of books by Diana Gabaldon, you will recognize the name Great Dismal Swamp. Um, and you can come and learn more about it at this program. Um, I know that we're kind of getting uh, to the end of things. Uh, we have Heidi one, has one more question. I think we have, I was going to say, we have time for like yeah, one more Yeah, it's from question. Caitlin. Sure. Um, the man who was captured with Lawson but set free, did he stay living in North Carolina or the New World? What happened to him after he escaped? He did live and he wrote his, uh, like I said, he wrote his whole um, narrative about what happened. It's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And I, it seems like I saw somewhere in the um, chat here, somebody was saying about the website returning an error. I'll have all this stuff up. Check check sarahwhitford.com on, on Friday. It might even be before Friday, but definitely by Friday, if you check my site, I'll have links to everything you could want to see about any of this. So um, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, watch this space basically. Watch this <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't have it, but it's like I say, it's just been a bad week. Oh, so I'm telling you, to get life, presentation together, so. we are going to just everybody today, uh, Carrie library had, had an issue today. We're giving everybody a pass. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you so much. Like I said, I, I learned a ridiculous amount, probably more than I should admit to you guys that I, I didn't know. So I'm looking forward to checking out your website at the end of this week and seeing all the resources you have. That's going to be fantastic. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us, uh, audience. Thank you for being a lovely audience. Um, and we hope to see you at Thursday's program because these just keep coming. Uh, Thursday's program for hidden uh, Raleigh's Hidden History, Exploring the Past, right in front of your eyes. So we had, you know, historical, historical, historical stuff with Sarah tonight, and we're going to make it a little bit more modern, but uh, still some kind of modern hidden history um, with our program on Thursday. So thank you everyone for joining us. 
Um, have a wonderful evening. Sarah, go give your dog some scritches from me. And, <laughs> and let everyone know, I think, I think my email address is on that tab. So also if anyone wants to email me, I welcome emails. I'm perfectly happy to answer any emails. If anyone has any questions that they want to send to me directly, I'm happy to do that. Sarah at sarahwhitford.com. Excellent. Although don't say that because we've got some great people who like information and they may be emailing you like, tell me about this. I love okay, it. good. You guys heard it here first. Go, go be best friends with Sarah. She wants that. All right. Thank you guys. We're going to call it an evening. Have a wonderful night and I'll see hopefully all of you on Thursday. You included Sarah. You're invited. Come on. Thank you so much. I appreciate if it. You everyone. can make it. Bye-bye.